Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this Cabinet meeting uh, on the 29th of June. Um, first item on our uh, agenda. Uh, any apologies? No. Um, minutes of the previous meeting, which have been circled. Move and yeah. Thank you. Um, item number three is a declaration of interest. Oh, all those in favour of the minutes? Good. Uh, our next item is a declaration of interests. Anybody? Uh, item four is question time to receive questions from any members of the public in pursuant of the executive uh, procedure of rule number 13. There's nothing. Item five is matters referred to the cabinet in accordance with the overview and scrutiny procedure rules. So this is, and I pass this over to the chair of corporate scrutiny. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you will, of course, be aware, Mr. Chairman, because you were present the evening of corporate scrutiny. Uh, scrutiny took some time to look at some high-level figures from the housing repairs team on the um, basic KPIs around repairs, whether they be emergencies or standard repairs currently undertaken by the council's contractor. Uh, during that discussion, we managed to tease out a point that councillors from all sides of the chamber basically thought was important. And obviously I've been asked to come on behalf of the committee this evening to recommend to you the following. That the council um, uses all avenues and all complaints uh, when looking at its complaints procedure. That came about, Mr Chairman, simply because uh, we, we, the committee were updated that last, in the last 12 months there's been 22 complaints about housing repairs. And I think anybody who's been involved in this council a while knows that that is a fundamentally flawed process and we believe it comes from because only if it goes through the tell us scheme the council's portal does it get registered as an actual complaint where many councillors at the committee whether they be conservative labor independent all felt actually we're missing other avenues of how the public seemed to complain there were some examples used but i'll give you again my example you may remember from the evening which is my wife and young baby attended a show at the assembly rooms last year and basically there was dinosaurs running around the stage and puppets etc it was a show for babies and she went with some friends who's also got babies, there were six of them, so they decided to have lunch in the assembly rooms after the show to discover that during the kids' show there was no high chairs at the assembly rooms. So these other mothers complained to my wife, who was a councillor at the time, surely we should get some high chairs. So councillor Cook, or ex-councillor Cook, my wife, then reported that to the council to be told, unless it goes through the teller scheme, it won't be registered. So she said to her friends, can you put it on the teller scheme? And her friends rightly said to her, you are a councillor. I have complained. What the committee got to, and there were some other examples used, was when we say there's only 22 complaints about housing repairs, is that a genuine figure or is it just the data we're looking at? And I think if we think about the data that's in front of us this evening, if we said for the sake of argument, 10% of emergency repairs are not getting done immediately, that's potentially at 17,000 repairs, just using rough figures, 1,700, which if you break it up to the 10 wards, is 170 potential complaints a year. I'm in Trinity where we've got 16 council houses, so I'm not going to get that many. But if you're in Belgrave or Stony Delf or Amington or Mercian, where there's a lot of council houses, you're in the risk of 300 complaints a year. So any councillor will tell you if there's only 22 complaints about housing repairs across Tamworth in a given 12 months, something is flawed with that data. So the recommendation is that we, we ask Cabinet to work on a process to try and capture all avenues of public complaints, whether it be via Facebook, uh, via Teleschemes, via councillors raising issues with officers, and it's just to explore how we can capture more data about what's potentially going wrong. And I think that arms us as a council Council to tackle real problems. I, you know, I think about the data I've looked at for 20 years, and part of me now thinks, was it fundamentally slightly flawed and could have been looked at different? So the recommendation to you as a cabinet, if it pleases you, is basically, can we look at avenues to capture more of the data? Thank you. Happy to take any questions, Mr Chairman, of course. Just a comment. So I think um, 
whilst this is talking about housing repairs, I think complaints in general comes under under my portfolio. In the day job, I help a lot of businesses around complaints processes, and uh, I would definitely agree that all complaints should be um, captured, mm. and uh, there needs to be a process to capture them, with, whether it's through the tellers or whether it's something else, but I agree that they should all be captured. So I'm happy to support the recommendation. Yeah, so I think it is important that uh, all complaints are captured um, and there's, there's obviously a number of different ways that that can be done. Um, the advent of social media is, is a big one it's, uh, that's here. Uh, the website, I mean the TELUS uh, website as well, um, I think that definitely needs to be looked at and there needs to be, uh, um, I would suggest there needs to be a multi varied way of uh, actually providing that feedback um, but it does need to come under the it did, does need to be tailored to some extent with the incoming regulations housing regulations that are coming through so it's not just as simple as kind of maybe just putting it all together in, in an hour it needs to be properly looked at so I will definitely be doing that so I, I will support this recommendation yeah thank you for that uh, councillor cook yes uh, we're all interested in making sure that the the most relevant accurate and you know up-to-date uh, information because that's when we can make all good decisions uh, and i do concur with my colleagues we are looking at it we're also going to be looking at how we future proof this as well so it's not just capturing it today looking at what's going to happen over the next you know several years so that we're all wiser and we can perform better so thank you for that recommendation all those in favour? So I think I'm, I'm happy to move. I'm seconded. Oh, sorry. On behalf of Carpet Scrutiny, can I say thank you to Cabinet? Thank you. All right, next item is item six, which is the, uh, the quarterly performance. Uh, report which um, I gave at court, corporate scrutiny uh, the other evening. Uh, there has been a slight um, uh, clerical amendment to, uh, to, the, to the report, a bit of a typo on the front page, so uh, it sh should, should have said the cabinet to endorse the content, contents of the report, approve for each project detailed with the capital outturn section in the financial health check report, appendix one. The re-profiling of the budget, profiteering of the budget and the authorities' capital programme for 23-24 total expended total of 29.154 million. So with that little uh, amendment or correction, um, any questions from my team on what was delivered? Got a question. Um, previously, um, certainly when Joe was around, there was always in the executive summary a table showing what the corporate scrutiny had rev uh, uh, commented and reviewed in detail. That's not here this time. I think that's really um, an important piece. Yeah, so I get that people can be off, but someone else needs to do it. There should be someone covering every single task. You shouldn't really be presented without it, with my view, um, in the future. Um, obviously, I mean, there's nothing controversial in there from what I can see, but mm. that was a key piece of information, <clears throat> and someone should cover if someone's off. Thank you. So yeah, just um, it's not really some, it's not really questions. It's just some commentary, really. Um, don't want to go on about it, but just um, in terms of the design um, of some of these and how they're put together. So um, <clears throat> essentially, twenty three. Um, so page twenty three. That's the page number at the bottom. Um, 
So I did have some examples, but I don't think I brought them. But basically, this I, I get how this is calculated, this current risk matrix, um, and you're using numbers, and it's basically times in it and adding it and equaling it together. Um, but I think it would be a good idea to kind of have some um, more actual numbers on there around those graphs. Maybe each one of these um, blocks should actually be its own page. And um, I've seen in other risk matrices how you've got uh, the information um, on the uh, sort of Y and X axis. Oh, I have actually got it. So there you go. So that's just an example. I think it's just a little bit more visual. Um, so I can give that to you later if you want. But I just think it would just really, really help. Um, also on the same page, 25, but also leading into the other ones as well. You've got a target date. I didn't know if there's supposed to be a target date in there as well. So maybe something to add there. Because uh, at the moment, is there a target? And 20... Where have we got to? 20... Back to page 18, hopping around a bit. Oh, right, okay. So, could be it was added afterwards. And which numbering are you using? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 25. Is, is. No, I'm using the one sort of on the portrait side at the bottom, the page number. Which one is it? So, one second. Mm -hmm. So, is that the, um, the financial stability yeah. bit? This one? Yeah, yeah that's it. The, uh, it's 25 on the left. Yeah, because yeah, there's no it's 25. 25 and or 17 depending on which way you're looking at it so item one so I think on most of them if not all of them the target dates are missing so something to maybe look at um, then I've just got an issue with the key. Um, so page 18, using the name, same page format. <clears throat> yeah, 18. 18. 18. Uh, one eight. Uh, one second. Nope, sorry, it's 26, it's, it's 26. So yeah, so I've just, it's just within this bit where you've got the risk control measure status. Um, you've got an arrow pointing to the right, but there's no specific key for that. Mm. You might think the key is on page 13, but actually that key represents something different. Mm. So there's nothing that says what that, what that arrow pointing to the right is. So that's basically it on that one. Yeah. That's it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, just one for me. I think where we've got uh, quite a sort of, you know, where we've got warning statuses against some of them, we, I, I would like to see some action plans built in as well to sort of drive what 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 some of the what what is the council doing about uh, some of the items that it deems as uh, as an issue uh, essentially and and, and sort of a, a publish on that even if it's as an appendix or whether it's a, a, a paragraph in here that points you to where you can go for a further action plan because I don't yeah we seem to have a uh, quite a bit in here without any actual plans. At least if they're in red, it would be good to... Yes, exactly, like the the, uh, the corporate risk, one of the original matrix and corporate risk matrix. I know that's shifted, but you would like to see a sort of a further plan. Thank you.
Thank you for that feedback. Um, obviously, as we improve on all these reports, it will only make it better for us to understand where we're at. So, uh, I'll guarantee you, you know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, um, with those uh, comments, um, I'm looking for somebody to move. Second. Your vote, all those. That's that one. <coughs> uh, our next item is item seven, which is the Tamworth Buddha <coughs> Council grant schemes. Uh, and the, this report will be delivered by uh, portfolio holder for the environment and health and community partnerships. Thank you, Chair. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, essentially this report is a, uh, a statement of what has already happened. Oh, you need to turn your mic off. Can you hear me now? That's better. Essentially this is a report to, um, to state what has already happened uh, with the uh, various grants we, uh, we give out. We've got three small grant schemes, the community grants, councillor community grants and festive grants and various pots of money that the councillors can give out individually or as part of the, uh, the nominations and grants uh, subcommittee. So uh, the appendix details many of the projects that have been supported, all very well worthwhile um, and it's good that we can, uh, we can hand out uh, some money to deserving causes um, in the way that uh, councillors see fit with the uh, uh, to, to, to help their local community groups. Um, so, yeah, the, the report is just to, uh, for information really, um, just so that uh, members are aware that I'm looking to hopefully improve the, uh, the, the grant scheme, um, already looking into work on it to, to, to make it a little more simplified so that we've, uh, we've not got so many dotted around and um, to, to make it a little less, uh, I mean, the way I see it, we don't really need uh, councillor community grants and festive grants. We probably just hopefully have uh, a set amount that uh, councillors can give out using the uh, the regular process, but um, that, that's to come. Anyway, for, for the purposes of this report, um, the uh, recommendation is that the Cabinet just endorses the outturn of the funding approved by the Nomination and Grants Subcommittee 22-23. And, uh, that's essentially it. I'll move that and happy to take any questions if I can answer them. Councillor Jane. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, obviously, I support the report. Just a quick question. Um, would it be possible to look at in the future if there's an underspend rather than just being sort of lost back into the budget for the next year? It's always a shame when money that's assigned for community groups, could we have something that goes, if there's underspend, we do x with it so that it's not you know people don't miss groups don't miss out yeah it's a fair point it's something i went actually meant to raise it's actually a, a little bit heartbreaking when you see that money that we could have given out um has not been uh, it's it, it's a waste um but you know it is what it is um thankfully we're not talking huge amounts but yes totally take your point uh, there should be a default fallback on it rather than being profiled into the next year's budget but yeah um, totally appreciate that and uh, I'd very much like to see that happen as well uh, thank you for that um, you're happy to move second all those in favour to the country Thank you. I think that concludes the business for this evening. Oh, there's one more, is there? Oh, yes, sorry. I'll turn the page, Jay. Ah, TJ. <laughs> yes, uh, our next item is, is to uh, the authority to release process, and that's in the portfolio hold, holder for operations and finance. Councillor Jay. Thank you very much. Um, this is, I believe, just a bit of uh, housekeeping, really. 
Um, the report provides us all with a revised process and guidance to enable um, access to personal information when it's processed by the council with uh, respect to constituents. So, as councillors, all of us here and all of us uh, elected to the council, we have data protection responsibilities for any personal information from constituents that we process and we're data controllers under the data protection legislation. Um, that applies when we're representing constituents or carrying out official duties um, or representing the council. Now, if you're in any business where you are a data controller, it's normal to ask for authority to use that data. At the moment when constituents contact us, we are all guilty of just contacting officers and saying, right, we want, we want this information. And they have to come back to us and say, well, actually, have you got authority to do that? And there's like this convoluted process to get authority. This makes it simple. If you want to deal with something for a constituent, they give you the authority, and that goes to the officers, and you get the information much quicker. It's a much smoother process, basically. So it's a bit of housekeeping. Um, two options, really. Obviously, we could do nothing and leave it as it is. But feedback from um, councillors and officers is the process is outdated and causes unnecessary delays and frustration. So um, the recommendation here is to uh, implement and approve the new process and train it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jake. Any questions, comments? Councillor Cooper? Yeah, I'll be uh, supporting this because any anything that, that makes it easier for officers and councillors alike to uh, to deal with residents' issues, and that's that's uh, that's got to be a big win for us. Um, as well as managing our data, obviously we know the ramifications of data leaks through GDPR and all all, all the rest of it is uh, is 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 serious. So uh, this new process, uh, it's it's good to see. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll be supporting it myself. Thanks, Summers. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, anything that can streamline this process uh, is great, but it also needs to be, we absolutely must be uh, trained out to every member of staff that deals with inquiries from us because you do get inconsistent answers as to what is and isn't allowed and what authority you've given and whatnot. It, it's been like this for years and it, it's often forgotten what has been agreed. So we, we need to absolutely make sure that this gets to the right people so that we're not going around the houses on it. Um, it did initially scare the heck out of me when councillors were designated as their own data controllers um, because you've not got the shield of council resources if you make a mistake. But um, So it, it was quite concerning to me when that development occurred. Um, but, I mean, thankfully the ICO take a... Um, an easier view on people who are first-time offenders, um, which you would hope would be enough to uh, to prevent it from any other occurrence happening again. Uh, but still, it's, it's, it's a little bit worrying because it used to be that you were kind of shielded behind the council. <laughs> um, and now you're, you have individual authority over that data, which is, you know, I get the point, but um, you know, it, it, it kind of, you have to really take that responsibility on and, and seriously, so um, still concerns me a little bit. But like I say, if the ICO continued to be lenient for your first time offence, and as long as you haven't emailed a spreadsheet of all of your resident personal details on purpose to somebody, then you know um, you, you should be okay. But uh, yeah, yeah, overall, good to see the process being overhauled. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There were inconsistencies before, made it difficult. For staff and councillors um, this gives that better level of protection it comes with a guide but there'll be training um, so there'll be one consistent approach no matter who you speak to um, or who's dealing with it so yeah absolutely looking for somebody to move it or do you want a question yeah sorry just a question um, so at the moment, if anybody actually submits any kind of um, information online or any kind of digital service, um, are, are they basically um, ticking something or saying that they're happy for their information to be shared? Do you want to come in there, Nicola? Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so currently um, it is a consent form signed by the councillor and your resident and that's sent in to member inquiries 
or he was member of housing inquiries. This is a form for councillors to complete um, that declares that you are response, you, you are you know dealing with an inquiry and you're looking to access information. Um, and that form also notifies as well that you are um, accepting the requirements from a DP perspective. So that may be your privacy notice to the resident. It may be that they understand that you can't share that information. Um, that form comes into one team um, and the officers then will look at the form. If it meets the requirements, they will then send that on to the officers then in order to get your response. So it all is managed centrally within one team now going forward. Can I just ask, is that then a form that we're then passing over to you? Yes, it will be, you can either, there will be two options. You've got a document that you can sign and email in a copy, or there'll be an online form that you can complete and submit, and that will send all the information to us. So just to clarify, if they're having to use a service online, um, and they're then expecting to receive information back, is that information allowed to be shared across the wider council? Or? Are you referring to if the council completes the form or your resident? A resident online using a digital service. Okay, it's not the resident that will complete the form, it's the councillor that will complete the forms and not the resident. So say for example a resident turns up at your surgery and asks for some help with a housing issue. You will complete a form because you need further information from the council in order to respond to them. That may contain just normal personal data. It may contain some health data or some special categories. We know it data. Depending on what that is, you'll complete the form. You, I mean, we recognise that you would probably get an email, a text message. It might be somebody speaking to you in the street. There's no um, one size fits all. It's a, it's a judgment call in the case. But obviously there is a requirement that we have to meet for a data protection perspective and therefore as long as that requirement is met then we can obviously share that information but i will say one thing that if we do receive any information um, where we can't share it but there is an action so say for example you've had a conversation with a vulnerable resident and some action is needed straight away we're not going to stop and not send that on to the relevant team or the officer we will make sure this is more about sharing the data we hold with the councillor so the ownership really is moving back onto the councillor to complete the form and request the information not the resident I that helps Sorry, it's great to hear it's being simplified. That's all, you know, I want to start with that. Would it be easier, you know, a lot of the time we get emails saying there's, we've got an issue, can you help us with this? Would that supporting evidence with that document be better for you just to satisfy maybe some of your, you know, um, worries about it? If we sort of gave you the form and then attached that email to it and sent it to you so, you, so we've got that audit trail if we need to be, yeah? Thank you, yeah, that's great. send that over with the form um, that meets the requirement and then we can action that. Um, there is some SLAs from our perspective to make sure that you get your acknowledgement and obviously a response within a period of time and we will manage that as we go along. Um, one of the things to mention as well, it's particularly useful for if you um, any councillors get issues from other wards. Um, you know, there are certain councillors who, you know, people, let's take Mr Kingston for example as an independent, some people will go to an independent, for example, because they want them to deal with it, but they live in a totally different ward. This allows them to do that if they give the authority. So. Uh, just want, I just note that the, uh, form, uh, the form for councillors to complete when requesting access to personal information uh, will be Word PDF document. It's on member zone as well as Word PDF. Um, is there any way that that can be sort of incorporated into Power Apps with the Azure uh, platform? It just makes things so much easier when we're filling out forms we tend to find. I know TBC does seem to be quite behind the curve on the old Azure platform with regards to the full use of the suite of, um, of, 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 of um, app applications on offer. Power Apps for this would be great. It would just instantly, you, you, essentially, as, you, as you're filling it out, um, the, the councillor, you would see it as an officer in live format with the councillor's initials filling it out, and it's just that it just makes things so so much quicker and snappier. Also, as well, it helps with GDPR because there's, there's no way that 
form can be sent accidentally somewhere else, printed out, left, or it's all online within a, a secure cloud-based format. Can I just, before we come in to say something, so this will be, um, the preferred option is digit, to be digi do it digitally. There is a digital version, as well as a Word and PDF, if needed. The preferred is always to be the digital. I know it's not quite the full or single and dance yeah. version you're referring to, yeah. but the preference is the digital. The Word and PDF is just in case it's, it's needed. Do you want to come in, Nicola? Um, I can speak to the apps team. Um, they are using Power BI and obviously exploring those options, and we have got some cases they've been working on, so this may be one of them that I can ask them to have a look at. So I'm quite happy to be in touch with you once we've got some further ideas on it. But it is digital as well at the moment, but we'll all explore that as well. Yeah, whilst it's digital, normally with modern document uh, control, we, we do look at those sort of power apps. It's just that there's less of a chance of the document being messed around with. You, you know, you, say, you send a document out, it's uncontrolled, it doesn't matter if it comes to a councillor, a member of the public or another officer. As soon as that leaves the platform, it's an uncontrolled document that can be messed with, played around with, then fired back. And what should happen through document control is that then becomes a version two. However, it never does. It just lands as the proper version. And so with at least through using sort of like a, a power apps basis through the Azure, you can control that document control. So what can come back to you is only the document that you started out with at the start, not something else. Yeah. So just to echo that, I definitely um, share the same sentiment as uh, Councillor Cooper. Uh, and, and when we were talking about future proofing as well, you know, using the Azure and uh, Power Apps as well, um, honestly, it's all going that way. So you might as well get on, get on that straight away and, you know, future proof yourselves. Thank you. Uh, if everybody's uh, had their comments and say. Um, Looking forward to uh, moving and seconding. Happy to move. All those in favour? To the contrary? That's it then. Uh, well, thank you all for attending. Um, thank you for your comments and support and questions. And it's great to see so many in the uh, looking at this in the public. So have a lovely evening. See you next time.